Yeah. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. So uh, my name is Liz Lovis, and I'm the training director of the um, Tarjan Center, which I think most people know is our University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. And um, it's a pleasure to in sort of introduce our speaker here today and also welcome all of you. Also on behalf of not just the Tarjan Center, but this is a joint sponsored uh, lecture series with the IDDRC, so that's our Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Research Center and CARD, the Center for Autism Research and Treatment. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker today, I also wanted to let you know that this is the last lecture of this academic series this year, but we are going to be sponsoring um, for the first time uh, a new type event. event. It'll be next um, month, June 10th, from 6 to 8 p.m. We're going to be doing a screening of Autism Goes to College. If you guys this movie. Um, it's a wonderful movie. I haven't seen it. I've heard from my team that it's a really great movie. It's, um, we're going to actually not only be able to screen the film over at Tampkin and Ronald Reagan from 6 to 8, but there's going to be a Q&A kind of panel discussion with the director, the producer, and also some of the cast members, so the young adults that you're going to see going to college. So I hope you guys can make it. This is the first time we've ever sponsored an event like this, and so we're excited and, and hope that people will also be excited to attend. Okay, so without further ado, again, it's my pleasure to introduce um, our speaker today, Dr. Patricia Renau. I'm so used to calling you Patty, but we'll go with official Dr. Patricia today. Um, Dr. Renau is a clinical psychologist at the UCLA CAN Clinic, which is our Child and Adult Neurodevelopmental Clinic here at UCLA. She's also a clinical instructor in the Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Division. Um, she's an associate director of the UCLA CAN REACH training program, which provides free workshops and lectures on autism spectrum disorder for families and community providers. Um, by way of background, Dr. Reno specializes in the assessment and treatment of ASD and related psychiatric conditions in children and adolescents. And after completing her doctoral degree in psychological studies and education here at UCLA, she received postdoctoral training at UCLA CARP, which is our Center for Autism and Research and Treatment. Um, she's worked on several clinical trials examining the efficacy of cognitive behavioral therapy to treat anxiety and related difficulties in children and youth with ASD. And her research has focused on the co-occurrence of anxiety and ASD and developing effective treatments for anxiety and social difficulties in school-aged children with autism. So with this great knowledge um, in the co-occurrence of ASD and anxiety, um, today she's going to be presenting what I'm sure is going to be a really useful, I think, and of course very interesting lecture on modified cognitive behavioral therapy for anxiety in children with autism spectrum disorder. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Renna. All right, thank you for that introduction. Um, so, um, like Liz was saying, I'm going to be talking today about anxiety and autism and modified cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and then at the end, I also have some resources for families and practitioners. Um, so just, I wanted to start off by giving a little bit of background on anxiety um, disorders. And anxiety, as everyone knows, is a normal emotion that we all experience from time to time. Um, a lot of kids will feel anxious or nervous at different points in their life. So kids might feel anxious, you know, at the start of a new school year. They might feel anxious when they're starting a new activity or before an upcoming exam. And that's all um, very normal anxiety that we can all um, experience and anxiety actually can be adaptive in many ways so it can motivate us to for example study for an exam um, it also can keep us safe from dangerous situations um, however when we think about anxiety disorders that's when the anxiety um, gets to be too much and it's very very distressing to the person it doesn't go away right away and it starts interfering in a child's life so it starts keeping them from doing things that they should be doing. So it might stop a child from attending school because they're too anxious about s separating from their parents. It might stop a child from participating in the classroom or from doing extracurricular activities. And so that's when anxiety really becomes a problem and we think of it as an anxiety disorder. Um, and just some background, I always like to reference kind of the first article on autism, um, but by Dr. Leo Connor in 1943. Um, he mentions anxiety and feelings of nervousness and fear in um, a couple of his first case studies um, that he describes of children with autism. And so anxiety has been around in the context of autism for a very long time. Um, 
He talks about Donald. He wouldn't get on the slide because he was horror struck. Um, Barbara was very timid and fearful of a bunch of different things. And then Alfred was um, a big worrier. Um, so um, also just to talk about why it's important that we talk about anxiety and autism. It's one of the most common associated psychiatric concerns that we see. Um, and it's associated um, with a number of other um, phys physical and psychosocial symptoms. And so it can have a negative effect on school performance, on peer relationships, on family functioning. It can also exacerbate core autism symptoms. And a lot of times in kids um, with high functioning autism, a lot of times the anxiety is even causing more interference and more distress for them and more problems than even their autism symptoms. Um, it's also associated with more problem behavior. Um, more aggression, um, gastrointestinal illness, self-injurious behavior, and depressive symptoms. Um, so it really can impact these kiddos a lot. Um, and we know that anxiety is much more common in children with autism um, than in typically developing children. And so um, there's been several studies that have looked at prevalence rates um, in youth with autism. And um, this, um, Van Stiensel and colleagues did a meta-analysis where they kind of took all of the research articles that had been done and put them together and really found that about 40% of youth with autism, so those 18 and under, met um, cutoffs for an anxiety disorder. So very, very common in our kiddos. Um, and I wanted to talk just a little too about the different types of anxiety that we see. Um, and so we see um, in about 9% of youth with autism rates of um, separation anxiety disorder. And so separation anxiety disorder is really um, uh, describes those kids that have a hard time separating from their parents. They often worry a lot about something bad happening to their parents when they separate or something bad happening to themselves and so that they would never see their parents or loved ones again. Um, oftentimes they have a really hard time being alone. Um, it can often be associated with school refusal. Um, they often also co-sleep with their parents because they they're scared of falling asleep alone. Um, and it can be really um, interfering and impactful for families. Um, we also see um, high rates of social anxiety disorder. Um, and so social anxiety disorder occurs in about 17% of youth with autism. And um, for social anxiety disorder, we really feel, um, see the hallmark of that really being a fear of being negatively evaluated by others. And so kids might talk about worries about other kids laughing at them, about other kids thinking that they're stupid, that nobody likes them, that they're going to embarrass themselves in front of others. Um, and they might avoid social situations. So they might not want to go out to play dates or birthday parties um, or participate in class. Um, and they might you know, freeze up in these situations and not be able to speak. Um, we also see high rates of generalized anxiety disorder. And so these are the kiddos that just always seem to be worrying about everything. Um, sometimes they'll have nicknames of like being worry warts. Um, they'll worry about themselves being good enough at things. Um, about um, things related to school and how well they're doing. A lot of times um, kids who are perfectionists kind of fall in this um, group as well. Um, oftentimes they'll worry about their health, the health of their parents, um, about um, family finances. A lot of times they'll worry about stuff going on in the world. So like they'll worry about volcanoes, um, even though they, they live in Los Angeles, or about hurricanes, or global warming, or homelessness. Um, and so just a lot of kind of worries about um, these types of things. Um, and it's also often associated um, with physiological symptoms too, so muscle tension, difficulty sleeping, um, headaches, um, stomach aches. Um, and then the most common type of anxiety disorder that we see is specific phobia. And so this is a fear of um, very specific things. And so it could be a fear of animals, so fear of bees um, or dogs. Um, could be fear of getting shots or going to see the doctor. It could be a fear of vomiting. Um, 
and you know, a lot of these things are not enjoyable experiences. Like nobody likes getting a shot, but for these kids that really meet criteria, it's when that fear is really interfering with their life. So these kids might be behind in getting their immunizations or they might be behind in going to their doctor for a checkup because they get so, so distressed by it. And um, it's hard for parents to tolerate seeing their, their child like that. Um, um, and so, you know, when we think about specific phobias, um, it's really, um, it's not just kind of a dislike or discomfort around these things. It's where it's really impacting and significantly interfering in their lives. And for things like animals, you know, some kids might avoid going to the park because there might be bees at the park or they're avoiding going a certain way to school because they might have a dog or they don't want to go to their aunt's house because their aunt has a dog. And so it does really impact their day-to-day -day life. Um, and then we also see higher rates of obsessive compulsive disorder too. Um, so in about 17% of youth. Um, and this is really kind of unwanted thoughts and images um, that are distressing that a child doesn't want to be thinking about but has a hard time not thinking about. Um, and it's often um, accompanied by repetitive behavior to try and reduce that anxiety. And so kind of the classic example of this is, you know, a fear of germs. And so a child repetitively washes their hands or doesn't want to touch certain things. Um, and then, you know, as you guys might be aware of, um, and have seen in your practice, we also see some ambiguous anxiety symptoms that seem to be more related to having autism. And so um, Dr. Connor Kearns, who's out at Temple University, has done a lot of research on these more kind of atypical types of anxiety that we sometimes see in autism. And these you'll notice are much more related to autism symptoms. Um, and so we might see more atypical specific fears um, so fears, for example, of toilets that we might not necessarily see in typically developing youth um, or like a fear of a, the happy birthday song. Um, we also might see more of an atyp what she calls an atypical social fear, which is for our kiddos who um, don't necessarily have the theory, theory of mind or the perspective taking ability to really have those negative cognitions of something bad happening to them, but still really appear anxious or nervous in social situations. Um, we also sometimes see fear of change. Um, and so, you know, kiddos with autism often don't like change. That's hard for them. Um, but this is really like worry ahead of time that there might be a change in their schedule. Um, and then we also sometimes see fears related to their special interests. So worries during the day that they might not engage in their special interests later on in the afternoon, not be able to access like the iPad, for example. Like, you know, what if mom doesn't give me the iPad and really spend a lot of time worrying about that? Um, and then there can also be fears around sensory sensitivities. Um, and so not wanting to go to certain places or worry ahead of time that, for example, at the birthday party, there might be loud noises there. And so trying to avoid that situation. Um, when we think about the presentation of anxiety, we really think about kind of three main areas. So there's the physiological manifestation of anxiety that we see, and that is really our fight or flight response. Um, and so that is oftentimes we'll get a pounding heart, we'll start sweating, we'll get headaches, stomach ache, dizziness, muscle tension, sometimes shortness of breath, sometimes people will start shaking a little bit. And that is really our physiological response. Um, we also see the manifestation, the behavioral manifestation of anxiety, which is like avoid. So we, anything that's scary, we want to avoid to protect ourselves from anything dangerous. Um, so we might try to escape the situation. We might also ask for like repetitive reassurance that everything's going to be okay from mom. Um, or we might try to distract ourselves because um, anxiety is telling us something bad is going to happen um, and we want to avoid. Um, and then we see the cognitive manifestations of anxiety as well. And so um, those are often those kind of negative think, um, thoughts that we have about the situation, the worries that we have, all of the bad things that we think are going to happen. Um, and so oftentimes we'll catastrophize and we'll think, oh my gosh, if I get an F on this test, I'm going to get an F in the class, I'm never going to get into college, and then I'm never going to have a job. And these are really, you know, worries that people have. Um, and yeah, so there's kind of those three main areas. And this is a cartoon we use with some of the kiddos, but he's, he's really not having a, a good day. <laughs> he's experiencing a lot of anxiety. Um, 
And then what this also might look like in autism. So, you know, in kids with autism, they might not be telling you what their worries are, or what they're actually nervous about. And um, it might just be, you know, we're noticing an increase in sensory behaviors to reassure themselves or an increase in repetitive behaviors or ritualistic behaviors. Um, sometimes when kids are anxious, they might engage in more socially inappropriate behavior. So might ask inappropriate questions if they're feeling more anxious. Um, or they might engage in more challenging behavior, so become aggressive when they're feeling anxious or distressed. Um, and then again, it might be harder for them to really identify kind of those negative cognitions that they're having about the situation. Um, so just briefly to touch on kind of why we think it is so common in ASD. Really, we don't know yet. There is a lot of research that's looking at it. People are looking at um, different mechanisms in the brain and different brain structures that are related to autism and anxiety. So in particular, the amygdala. So seeing if differences in the amygdala related to having autism might predispose someone to then have higher rates, higher anxiety. Um, so they're looking at that. There might also be a genetic component. Um, there have been studies that have shown higher rates of anxiety and mood disorders um, in parents of children with autism. So some sort of kind of predisposition might be a factor. Um, there's, um, people are also looking at neurocognitive mechanisms. So a lot of kids with autism have executive functioning deficits, so they have a harder time thinking flexibly about situations, so they might get more stuck on those anxious thoughts and not be able to kind of problem solve and think about more adaptive, calm thoughts to help them with their anxiety. Um, kids with autism also have a perseverative thinking style a lot of the times, and so just like they might perseverate on their special interests, they might be more prone to perseverate on worries and anxiety and like global global warming or tornadoes. Um, and so that might also be a factor. And then my research in grad school um, looked at high levels of daily stress um, related to having autism. We know in, typically, in the typically developing literature that um, high levels of daily stress contributes to anxiety and overall just negative mood. Um, and so I looked at um, daily stress related to autism symptoms. So does a child get more stressed um, due to their sensory symptoms? For example, if they're feeling stressed from like bright lights in the classroom or from loud noises, or they're getting extra stress from changes in their routines um, or not being able to engage in their preferred activities, um, if that then contributed to greater anxiety or just the unpredictableness of social interactions and having to do that could be really stressful for kids. Um, and I did find um, that that did predict higher levels of anxiety, um, which also then predicted um, higher autism symptoms. And so it really was exacerbating those core um, ASD symptoms as well. Um, and then just to touch on kind of the assessment of anxiety in ASD, it is, it's tricky. It's really tricky. How do we decide, you know, if these symptoms are autism or are they anxiety? Um, and so, you know, it's really important to try and tease um, these symptoms apart because um, there can be a lot of overlap between them. Um, so for example, does a child have difficulties with peer relationships because they have autism and they don't know exactly what to do in that situation? They, you know, their insight into social relationships might be a little less developed um, and that's causing them difficulty. Or are they having difficulties with peer relationships because they're feeling anxious about approaching a peer, or worrying about inviting them over for a play date, and they're not doing that, and that's affecting their peer relationships. Um, and so, again, um, it can be very challenging to tease these symptoms apart. Um, there's lots of overlapping symptoms, and it's complicated by the fact that a lot of children with autism have a hard time communicating their feelings. Um, they might have impaired insight into their feelings. Even typically developing children you know, have a really hard time saying how they're feeling and recognizing how their bodies are feeling when they're feeling different ways. Um, so it can be really tricky. Um, and then you know, also, a lot of kids with autism also have co-occurring intellectual disability, which also can make it really hard to kind of understand what their um, internalized state is. Um, 
However, again, just to touch a little bit on the research, um, we do know that they can be reliably um, differentiated, and there's been a lot of studies that have shown that anxiety is not just a part of autism, that it can be differ differentiated. There's been statistical analyses that have shown that um, kids with autism show the same um, increases in skin conductance, so sweating um, in different situations that um, typically developing kids also show. Um, they also show expected treatment response. So when I talk about cognitive behavioral therapy, um, when it's used to treat anxiety, kids with autism have also they get better, like we would expect um, their anxiety symptoms. So we see the expected treatment response. Um, and then there have been studies that have seen similar genetic markers of anxiety in kids with autism as typically developing kids with anxiety. Um, and this is important. I know it's like kind of in the weeds for a lot of people, but um, because um, for a while anxiety was really seen um, as part of autism. And um, it's just important to note that it is different because there are treatments that we have for it. And if it is a concern for a kiddo, then, you know, it can be treated um, a lot of times with different behavioral therapies and also with medication. Um, so, okay, moving now to the treatment of anxiety. Um, so I'm gonna go through some of um, just the randomized control trials that have been done here at UCLA um, that have been shown, um, that have shown modified cognitive behavioral therapy to be efficacious in treating anxiety in youth with high functioning autism. There are a lot of limitations to the research that I'll go through at the end. Um, but just to start off, all of these studies were done with youth um, with autism with IQs 70 or higher who were verbally fluent. Um, so CBT we'll talk about, but it is a talk based um, therapy. And so it's important for the kids to have verbal ability. And so all of these um, studies that I'm talking about, um, they all had conversational abilities um, and IQs greater than 70. Um, and so um, just to talk a little bit again about the research studies that have been done and then I'll kind of dive more into what it actually looks like. Um, but these were some studies that were done at UCLA um, by Jeff Wood, who was my mentor, um, who's done a lot of work in the field of CBT um, in autism. Um, and this was the first study that was done um, that showed that um, modified CB, family-based CBT was efficacious in reducing anxiety in kids with high-functioning autism, um, kids 7 to 11. Another study was done after that one um, based on those promising results, and the CBT was actually extended for 32 weeks. Typically, programs are 16 weeks long. Um, this one was longer, and so in the first 16 weeks, they targeted anxiety in the kiddos, and then in the second 16 weeks, they worked more on social skills, um, and that was also shown to be effective, and I'll show in a couple slides the specific findings from that study. Um, and then he also did a study um, in early adolescence to look at the effects of CBT in adolescents 11 to 14 with autism and anxiety, um, which also had um, some nice, um, which we saw reductions in anxiety in. Um, and then his latest study um, is the TASE study. Um, which, um, so in the previous studies, it was all an active treatment group. So kiddos were either randomized to receive cognitive behavioral therapy or a wait list or a treatment as usual condition. And then after they completed that condition, they all received the therapy. Um, this study was a little bit more rigorous in design. And so it was um, Dr. Wood's um, short Bianca manual um, that was used in comparison to the gold standard CBT um, program for typically developing kids, so the coping cap program. So we, kids were either randomly assigned to receive the modified CBT, Bianca program, or coping cat, which is the gold standard for typically developing children with anxiety disorders. So results are still out on that one. It should be published very soon, actually. So we'll see how the modified CBT did versus just kind of the regular. Um, there's also been other researchers across the country that have looked at CBT um, in individual formats and group formats. Um, so Anne-Marie Chalfant has done a study. Um, Judy Reven runs a lot of group um, CBT programs. Um, and also Eric Storch out in Florida has done a lot of research on um, CBT in ASD with promising findings. Um, 
So just to touch on, uh, to show you some data, um, so this was the study that looked at, it was the 32 weeks of CBT. Um, and you can see um, from this graph, so this was at post um, assessments. So 71% of the kiddos that received the CBT immediately no longer met criteria for their primary anxiety disorder um, versus 0% of the people in the treatment as usual condition. So they all still met criteria for their primary anxiety disorder after their treatment as usual condition. Um, so some nice effects in terms of anxiety disorder remission. Um, and then we also saw effects on their social engagement with peers. And so this was really important to us too, especially in the 32 week long program because we also really targeted um, a child's social interactions with their peers. And so we had blind observers go at the beginning of treatment and then also at the end to um, do an observation of how much the child was interacting with their peers at recess and lunch. And we saw a nice effect of children at post-intervention um, interacting and more engaged with their peers at recess and lunch um, than those children who received the treatment as usual condition kind of still stayed the same. So that was really nice to see. Um, so now um, thinking about CBT, um, I'm kind of first going to go over some of the core principles of CBT and then talk about some of the modifications that we make. Um, so CBT is really based on the idea that our thoughts, behavior, and emotions are all related to each other. And so how we think affects how we feel and what we do. How we feel affects our thoughts and our behavior and how we behave affects our thoughts and feelings. Um, and so basically, if we can intervene at different and at, either at our thinking or at our behavior and can change our emotions and our thoughts and behaviors. And so um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But basically, if we, for example, think are thinking really anxious or worried thoughts about a situation, then we're more likely to feel anxious and to behave in an anxious manner. So if we're worried about a test that's coming up, we might think, oh, I'm going to fail it. We might feel really anxious or nervous, and then we might procrastinate and try to avoid studying for it. Um, versus if we think kind of a more calm, adaptive thought, we might think, oh, like I'm going to study hard for it, and um, you know, I've never failed a test before, so I'll probably do OK. We might feel a little bit calmer about it and be less likely to avoid studying. Um, so in terms of CBT, the phase one of it is really psychoeducation, so teaching the child about what anxiety is and all of our different emotions. And for kids with autism too, we oftentimes talk about what having autism means as well um, to give them some psychoeducation on that. And basically we teach them that anxiety is rooted in the brain. It's our fight or flight response. Um, it's normal. Everyone experiences it. Um, we teach them kind of what are the bodily cues of anxiety. And anxiety for different people can manifest in different ways. Ways. And so we really try and hone in on those um, uh, manifestations that the child themselves has. So for example, if they, you know, we've heard from parents that they always have stomach aches before school. So we might say, okay, you know, one way of telling when we're feeling anxious or nervous is, you know, we get stomach aches. Or um, sometimes we might get a little shaky or our voice might get quiet. Um, and so we teach them kind of those physical um, symptoms of anxiety. We also teach them to learn facial expressions, so how our face looks when we're feeling anxiety, um, as well as other emotions, just because we know that's a little bit harder for kids with autism. Um, and then with parents, we also teach them common patterns of child anxiety. And so basically that is when a child gets anxious, they get really, really distressed. Um, and then that's hard you know, for parents to see. And so oftentimes the child will remove themselves or the parents will remove them from the situation, um, but actually that reinforces the anxiety um, because that's what anxiety is telling us, that we need to avoid and it's not safe. And we know um, that to fight back against our anxiety, we need to stay in that situation and face the fear. Um, and so actually, even though it seems like we're helping the child by removing them from the situation, um, we're actually reinforcing in their mind that that situation is scary um, and that they shouldn't go to that situation. Um, 
then um, we usually focus on skills training, so teaching coping skills to kids for how to deal with their anxiety when they are. So first they need to recognize when they're feeling anxious, then we teach them what to do when they are feeling anxious. So a lot of times we'll teach them relaxation techniques. Um, we'll also teach them how to identify the negative thoughts that they're having about the situation. Um, and I'll show you this a little bit more in depth in a second. Um, and we do something called then cognitive restructuring. And so first you have to kind of identify the negative thought you're having about the situation. And then um, you can replace it with a calmer, more adaptive thought and some, a thought that's kind of actually what's more likely to actually happen. And that can help us also feel more calm. Um, and also teaching just positive self-talk. Like, I can do this. Um, so for example, um, um, we work with kids on how to identify negative thoughts. Um, and so these are the bad things that we think are gonna happen um, in a situation. So for a child with separation anxiety disorder, they might be thinking, if my parents leave me, they're gonna get in a car accident and I'll never see them again. So that's a really negative thought, right? <laughs> Um, so a lot of times I'll call them icky thoughts. Um, another example is, if I make a mistake, everyone's gonna laugh at me and no one is gonna wanna be my friend. Um, so that might be like a child with social anxiety. Um, I'm gonna fail this test and never get into college. Um, there's nobody who wants to be my friend. I don't fit in and I never will. So really kind of icky negative thoughts. Um, and so that's really, um, you know, after we figure out how we're feeling about a situation, kind of identifying what that negative thought is about the situation. Um, and then helping the child identify calm thoughts to fight back against those negative thoughts. Um, and so there's two really helpful calm thoughts that we often use to help a child generate more of these calm thoughts. But what's the likelihood of the bad thing happening? in this situation, um, and, or if it does happen, how bad would it really be? And so these work for everyone, if you guys are feeling anxious or nervous about something, but they, um, they work for different types of situations. So for example, a lot of times we'll use a roller coaster example, right? And so we'll say, okay, this child's feeling really anxious or nervous about going on a roller coaster. You know, we can tell they're anxious or nervous because they have a stomach ache, they're shaking a little bit. You know, what is the negative, what's the icky thought that they think that they're having? Or that, you know, what's the negative thing that they think is gonna happen? They think, oh, um, I might fly off the roller coaster. Um, and so um, at that point, kind of to identify a calm thought, it might be helpful to say, well, what's the likelihood of that actually happening? What's the likelihood of you actually flying off a roller coaster? Probably not pretty likely, right? And some kids get really into it. They're all about the numbers, so like they love it, you know. Um, you know, sometimes we'll ask like, do you know anyone that's ever flown off a roller coaster? Um, does your mom, has your mom ever met anyone that's flown off? Like, no, so it's probably not very likely. So that's kind of a calm thought, like it's not likely that I'll fly off. However, like you wouldn't want to use the next example, if it does happen, how bad would it really be, right? Because <laughs> that would be bad. <laughs> But um, that, the second one might be more appropriate, for example, if a child's worried about giving a speech in front of his class or reading in front of his class and um, worried about making a mistake. And so, you know, okay, let's say, let's say you do make a mistake. How bad is it really going to be? Like, probably nobody's even going to notice. Like, half the kids in your class are probably not even listening. <laughs> they're, th you know, they're thinking about what they're going to do at recess, what they're going to have for lunch. They're probably not going to notice. Even if they do notice, and let's say maybe somebody even laughs, like, do you think they're going to be thinking about it when they go home that night? Do you think they're going to remember it in a week? No. So it's probably not that big of a deal. Um, so just like this kind of first example, so probably nobody will even notice people make mistakes all the time. Um, again, thinking like nobody's perfect, I'm just doing the best that I can. Um, you know, for the one who was worried about friends, I just haven't found the right friends yet. There are lots of people I haven't met yet, who knows. Um, and then for the child with the separation anxiety, it's not very likely they'd get in a car accident. They've never been in a car in an accident before. 
Um, so those are some examples of that cognitive restructuring that we'll do. And then really, the majority of the sessions um, are spent doing skills practice and what we call exposures. And exposures are really, really important to CBT. Um, you can't do CBT without doing exposures. And so very early on in the treatment program, um, with the parents and with the children, we will create a hierarchy of their fear. So we'll identify all of the situations that make a child feel anxious or nervous, and we'll get fear ratings. So how anxious they feel in those situations. Um, and then we'll break those situations up into baby steps, and we'll even get ratings on those a lot of the time. So let's say like, a child raising their hand in class, they rate that as a 10. So then we might say, okay, well how, or reading in class might be a 10, um, reading in front of others. Okay, well how hard would it be for you to read in front of a mirror? Oh, that might be like a zero or a one. It doesn't make me anxious at all. And so we get, kind of create baby steps to that harder, to the ultimate goal. Um, and then we have kids gradually practice um, facing their fears, starting with baby steps and using the coping skills that they've learned um, at the beginning of therapy. Um, and then um, they practice um, these exposures in session with us um, and then are also assigned homework. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a little bit. Um, but it also, it's just really really important because we are changing the way these kids think about these situations and so really important to always reinforce at the end of session, you know, what did we teach our brain today? You know, we taught our brain that actually if we made a mistake while reading in front of others, it was no big deal. Nobody cared. I didn't die. Um, and always positive reinforcement for hard work and I'll talk about that in a little bit too. Is this making sense? Any questions? Um, so, um, again, just to give you a flavor of what therapy looks like, but for a kid with social anxiety, I've used this example, I've talked about it, but, you know, we might, we use lots of cartoons, and so we would say, how do you think this child is feeling? She's feeling nervous. How can we tell she's feeling nervous? What are some icky or worried thoughts that this girl is having? Do a couple thought bubbles. Um, and then what are some calm thoughts that she could think instead? And then have the child you know, start to problem solve. What are some ways that she could practice ahead of time so that she feels more confident in this situation? What are some things that she could do? She could read in front of the mirror. She could read and practice with her parents. She could practice with kids in the neighborhood and then you know, finally go up. Um, so just a little bit more background on BIACA, which is um, the program that Dr. Jeff Wood and Amy Drahoda and Karen Z. Wood developed here at UCLA. It's a manualized intervention program to treat anxiety in kids with high-functioning autism. Um, it's short for Behavioral Interventions for Anxiety in Children with Autism. Um, it's family-based um, therapy. It's 16 weekly sessions of 90 minutes each, and part of the session is spent with just the child, part is spent with just the parent, and then part all together. Um, it's modular based, so there's like about 10 or 15 different modules that the therapist can choose from to do with the child that day. Um, and it's flexible, so modular, you know, we love our modular treatments here at UCLA. It's flexible, so the therapist can really pick the modules that are appropriate for the child. Um, and like I was just saying, the first part is always psychoeducation, then skills training, and then practice. Um, and so thinking about some of the modifications that this program has used, um, in particular for kids with autism, um, is a large-scale reward system. And so um, this is really, really necessary. It's necessary to motivate the kids, and it's also just necessary to keep sessions fun. Like, we want therapy to be fun. We want the kids to like us. We want them to come back. Um, and facing your fears is really hard, right? It's hard. Adults don't want to face their fears. We avoid all the time. It's, so it's hard work, and so rewards are really compensation for the hard work um, and serve as motivation for the kids a lot of the time. Um, and just like you know, we go to work. Like we get rewards too for our hard work. We go to work. We get paid. You know, they're doing hard work. They should also get compensated. Um, and um, it's important that we use rewards that are motivating for kids, so we're not gonna offer them <laughs> Trojan socks. Um, 
Um, so it's important that we really identify things that are motivating. And a lot of times these, um, it works really well for these to be daily privileges. And so it's like, you know, you got to do your three UCLA homework tasks before you earn your electronics time. Um, can be simple enough. Um, and oftentimes, though, we will also, I'll show you kind of a homework chart that we'll use, um, but oftentimes kids can also earn points um, throughout the week for like a medium reward, um, which could be something a little bit larger, like getting to choose what restaurant they eat at um, over the weekend, going to a movie, getting a special toy, things like that. Um, and sometimes for older kids, longer term rewards too um, can work, or even for kids who you know might not necessarily need these external rewards. Um, but just to make it a little bit more fun and to acknowledge all the hard work that they're doing, um, you know, sometimes kids will earn like for 200 points, you know, a trip to a camping trip or a trip to Magic Mountain or something. Um, so rewards really keep it fun. Um, and then um, we also use a lot of visual aids. So like you've seen, like I've shown throughout this talk, a lot of cartoons. So really helpful for our kids to actually kind of see the situations and be able to write out the thoughts that they're having and the calm thoughts. Um, so lots of cartoons, lots of visual prompts. Um, we also um, use um, special interests a lot of times. So sometimes special interests can be distracting to our kids, but a lot of times they can be really helpful increasing a child's engagement in session. Um, and so for example, we might have, you know, Lightning McQueen is feeling really nervous about his upcoming race. What do you think he's, you know, thinking? Or what are some calm, th calm thoughts that he could be thinking? Um, or, you know, using SpongeBob in examples or whatever the child's special interest is, um, using them um, in cartoons. Um, we also, it can be um, really helpful to use them also as reinforcers for hard work. Um, also in the Bianca program, we also don't just target anxiety. And so we'll have autism symptoms also incorporated into the hierarchy if they're really interfering for the child. Um, and so for example, like a child who is socially anxious, we're not just going to say, okay, like you're socially anxious, so we're going to do exposures, you know, where you go up and talk to random people and not like actually teach them how to do that. Or like you're anxious about approaching peers, like just go up and do it, you know? We're, we're not gonna tell them to do that. We have to teach them what to do so that then they are successful. Um, and so there's, a, we do a lot of work around that as well. And so practicing ahead of time, you know, if they're anxious about talking to adults, before we have them maybe go practice buying something at the store, we'd have them practice with us and make sure, you know, to remind them and prompt them ahead of time to use a voice where the other person can hear them, to make eye contact, to maybe get a little smile, and, you know, to say thank you at the end. So there's also those types of skill trainings. Sometimes we'll also incorporate, like, conver um, conversation skills trainings for the kids. So especially if we want them to interact more with their peers at lunch. Um, you know, we might practice with them exactly how to do that, how to ask questions, how to make comments, how to have a back and forth conversation. Um, we also have a module on independence and self-help skills. Um, and so we usually will talk to parents about this early on and just kind of put it out there because these are so important for our kiddos with autism to start early to learn to do these skills independently. Um, and so even just kind of throwing like, you know, setting my alarm and waking up to my alarm early on. And we know that actually there's been research to show that um, increases in adaptive functioning skills are related to decreases in anxiety because it makes kids feel more confident and they're proud of themselves when they're doing these tasks, you know, that they know their peers are doing. Um, and so this can be a really nice component of the therapy as well. Um, and then I was talking a little bit about homework charts. So, you know, we would typically see them for 90 minute sessions, like in our outpatient clinic here, we see them for like 50 minutes. So it's very, very small amount of time during the week. And so homework is really, really important um, to get these kids to practice these skills throughout the week. So not only are they doing exposures in session, but they're doing exposures hopefully every day. The more practice, really the better. Um, and so this is like an example of a homework chart that we might do. And typically children will work on three to five skills um, a day. 
Um, and so for this one, you can see, you know, the first one isn't necessarily related to anxiety. It's more just behavioral compliance because this is what, you know, the child needed. But following directions by the second time I'm asked. That was really important to work on. Um, then this one had reading a paragraph to my family members. Um, and then another one that we like to do is went out in the community being the family ambassador. So if mom ever has a question or like they're out ordering dinner or whatever, then the child is the family ambassador and the child is doing and um, asking all the questions and giving the orders um, to give them extra practice. Um, we also go over specialized parenting techniques with the parents um, to help them in these situations when the, their children are really anxious and basically just talk to them a lot about modeling, staying calm, um, helping their child identify how they're feeling by saying things like, you know, you seem really anxious right now, you seem really worried right now. Um, and then ultimately just giving their child time to cool down on their own. Um, because we know anxiety goes up and then it always comes back down. And so just um, teaching the child that they're able to do that on their own and effectively kind of cope with their emotions. Um, can also be helpful when a child's feeling really anxious or nervous to give them choices. Um, so, you know, we don't want them to ever avoid a situation, but like maybe, okay, do you want to leave five minutes early or 10 minutes early? Or do you want to go two minutes late or one minute late or whatever? You can just help children feel more in control. Um, and then also rewarding children for their efforts um, is really helpful. Um, so just really quickly, um, I thought I would give, let me see what else I have. Um, just a case example. Um, so this was a 10-year-old boy um, with autism um, called Michael, um, who also met criteria for social phobia and generalized anxiety disorder. And he was really having a hard time on the playground. Um, he liked playing handball with the other kids, but had a really hard time losing. Um, he frequently fought with his peers um, about losing. He tried to change the rules so that he wouldn't lose. If he did lose, he would storm off. Um, and um, yeah, he would try and change the rules um, so that he would win to his benefit. And so this was very hard. Clearly, socially, other kids aren't gonna like this. Um, and then he also, you know, he would only play games that he felt really confident in. Um, otherwise, he would isolate himself um, at recess and had some fears about being rejected by other kids. So other kids aren't gonna like him. Um, and so our main goals um, in the program were really to increase his coping skills, so not to storm off in a rage and kind of be more flexible in these games, um, and um, to also decrease his fears related to rejection and increase his time engaged with other peers. So instead of you know, only playing games that he was really good at, increasing his um, engagement during the other times too. Um, so we worked on um, developing the idea of being a good sport um, and talked a lot about why keeping his cool is important, um, kind of a lot of perspective taking around what the other kids are thinking when um, he's storming off in a rage. Um, his kind of thinking was, I'll be one of the guys if I act like I don't care as much, so I'll be like cooler. Um, and then we practiced in session. So first we had him practice just tying and keeping his cool and rewarding him for that. And we practiced him losing and keeping his cool. And losing on purpose. And this is really just, again, to teach the brain that like it's okay. You're going to be okay if you lose. Um, you're still going to go home at the end of the day. You're still going to have dinner. Your family still loves you. You know, it's going to be okay. Um, and then we had him practice um, all of these things at home and at school during the week. Um, uh, and then in terms of, you know, hanging out with other kids during other activities, we also did a lot of the sessions at the park, too. And so we taught him how to go up to other kids and um, see what they're doing um, and engage with them as well on non-preferred activities um, and really taught his brain that those kids weren't going to reject him, you know, that actually they would continue playing with him. Um, and so, you know, he ended up he, um, doing pretty well, um, became a lot more flexible and developed some really nice friendships um, throughout the course of treatment. Um, this is just another, um, to give you a flavor of a child, a lot of common um, children that we see. This was a seven-year-old girl um, with autism who also had 
social anxiety, um, generalized anxiety and ADHD. And a lot of her worries were related to her academic performance. And so she's been a lot, a lot, a lot of time after school working on her homework, really, really didn't want to make any mistakes, often um, cried in class if like she was corrected. Um, or um, just easily um, kind of became emotionally distressed in class, um, worried about timed test situations, we see that a lot. Um, and then some social worries too about like embarrassing herself in front of others. Um, and she avoided interacting with her peers because of that. Um, and so one of the ways that we address perfectionism is by having the child, again, practice making mistakes. And so we would do, you know, little math worksheets and have her make a mistake on purpose to just show her it's okay, you know. Um, nothing bad that you think is going to happen is actually going to happen. Um, we worked on replacement behaviors for the tearful outbursts in class. And so instead of, you know, helping her learn to catch herself before she starts crying and instead ask for a break um, or ask for a water break to walk outside. Um, and then, you know, rewarding her for when she was able to do that. Um, and then teaching her a lot of social skills for what it means to be a friend um, and play date host skills. Um, and by the end of treatment, um, you know, she was rarely excusing herself from class, so she was much more able to handle her distress and her emotions, um, and she had made some closer friendships. Um, so, like I was saying before, there are a lot of limitations to this evidence base. All of the research really has been done in the clinic setting with lots of eyes on the case. Um, it still needs to be tested in schools and in the community. All of the research has been limited to youth um, with autism and IQs higher than 70. Um, there has been some work um, in adapting CBT for more minimally verbal um, youth with ASD and IQs lower than 70. That's still um, kind of being looked at. Um, but some of kind of the main um, ingredients for these type of more behavioral interventions, so a lot less of the cognitive piece, is really, you know, just graduated exposure to the feared situations. Um, a lot of modeling, so maybe have the therapist do it first, then have the child do it. Um, visual aids, and also just mantras that the child can repeat to themselves. So for example, um, it's going to be okay, I'm going to be okay. Um, and then just to wrap up, um, some resources for everyone. Um, there is a treatment guide for managing anxiety in people with autism that's listed there. That's great for parents, teachers, and mental health professionals. Um, uh, there's also a, um, a, a manual for CBT and ASD. Um, Dr. Wood has also published a man. This is his manual here. It's um, not specific to autism. It's for typically developing children, um, but it is the basic framework that Bianca was built on. And then just with the added, we added in the modifications for autism. Um, Dr. Wood also has a research study going on if you guys are um, providers in the community where um, he provides su weekly supervision via Skype um, and therapists in the community identify a child that's a good fit, fit for this type of um, intervention and then he they deliver the manualized treatment and he provides weekly supervision. So if that's something you guys are interested in, um, feel free to email him. Um, he's definitely recruiting for that study. Um, there are also some resources for families, um, so that, again, that same book. There's also, Phil Kendall has um, an online parent training program. Again, it's not specific to autism, but it does provide, give a lot of psychoeducation on anxiety and different types of anxiety disorders that we see in kids. Um, and then I just put a, a bunch of, you know, there's a lot of children's books that can help in talking to your child about anxiety and worry, um, and then a teen book, too. Um, and I just want to make sure and acknowledge my mentor, my mentors, um, Dr. Jeffrey Wood, Karen Z. Wood, Amy Drahoda, um, Kelly Decker, Lindsay Sterling, um, and my, also my colleagues. So, um, and a special thanks to all of the families that participated in our studies. Um, so thank you so much for your attention. I think we have about five minutes for questions. Um, has the program been used with adults and what modifications would need to be made? 
Yeah, so it hasn't. And um, I don't really know of any kind of CBT programs for adults at this time. Um, so that's definitely an area of need, and we see a lot of anxious um, and depressed adults in our clinic. Um, and we know that anxiety actually increases with age um, into young adulthood from childhood. Um, so it's definitely a need. Um, I think for adults, just from clinical practice, um, you know, sometimes it is still, I still like using cartoons and things like that, but it totally just depends on the adult. Sometimes those really aren't appropriate. Um, also, our extensive reward system would likely need to be modified to be more appropriate and more kind of having the adult kind of give themselves rewards, um, you know, when, when they feel like they've earned it. Um, yeah. Good question. How, how young would you go? Mm, yeah, it's hard. I always want to go younger, but then I'm like, eh, it's really hard. Um, so one of our studies went down to age six, um, but that is still pretty young. Seven is ideal. Yeah. And along those lines, IQ, would you, I know it's not for people below 70, but what would you do clinically? For lower, um, yeah, again, just more of the behavior, more of the exposures, less of the idea of like identifying the icky and calm thoughts and more just breaking down the feared situations into baby steps and rewarding um, when they complete each baby step. Um, and then some mantras, thoughts too can help. So just repeating kind of the same thought. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much. This yeah. very helpful okay. and useful CBT kids. Do you use, um, first of all, what's the age range of kids that you accept into the program? Yeah. Yeah, no, good question. So for some of these studies, it's been kids 7 to 11. And then also, um, we've done some studies in um, early adolescence, so 11 to 14. Do you use a specific social skills program, or do you just continually adjust for each child. Yeah. We, yeah, we don't use a specific social skills program, um, but bits and pieces from different ones, you know, that um, we found to be helpful. Other specific ones that you have found most helpful? Yeah, well, I mean, being here at UCLA, you know, the friendship program and the peers program, of course, um, you know, um, are really great. And actually, Jeff has published papers using elements of children's friendship training mm -hmm. with Bianca, and he actually even has a published manual that, that they um, wrote together, Fred Frankel and yeah. Jeff Wood, and then he yeah. also, we've written stuff where he's used um, peers for adolescents. So he, research-wise, they definitely have studied the use of both of those programs with Bianca. Great, thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, everyone. Thank